tornadoes, fire, floods, bombings. Natural or man-made, they're always destructive and it requires experienced, dedicated professionals to provide emergency services when these disasters occur. That's where you come in. Experienced, dedicated professionals, trained and ready to provide assistance when it's most needed. Today's training program can only provide the basics of safety and disaster assistance to help prepare you in providing your expertise to those who are in need of disaster assistance. Certainly, you'll receive more hands-on training and other training to help prepare for emergency services. But right now, let's take a look at some of your responsibilities when you're called upon to serve disaster victims. Keep in mind, the first priority is safety of the disaster workers. There's no disaster victim that can be helped if the lives of the emergency workers are jeopardized. Maybe you've been a member of a disaster assistance team and have seen firsthand what it looks like. Buildings in ruins, hundreds of people engaged in the search for victims, site security, massive logistics, and a wide range of other support services. It's mind-boggling to see how many emergency workers are organized and coordinated into one huge efficient organization determined to do whatever it takes to save the lives of victims. To begin with, it's the planning, practice, and training of agencies at all levels, including federal, state, county, and local governments. It just doesn't happen. It's planned for and practiced, and everyone is a part of the team. In disasters, you're likely to encounter issues such as personal safety, scene safety, disaster team safety, and the sights, sounds, and smells at the scene of the disaster. Don't forget the weather and site conditions. Darkness, shifting debris, wind, and rain all add to the rescue job. Don't forget an important part of your job, and that will be to deal with your own personal depression, anger, and other emotional downturns. There's a lot to consider when preparing for disaster assistance. Let's take a look at some of the basics of safety during disaster assistance. Keep in mind there are potentially thousands of events, conditions, and other variables that can impact upon these things you need to do. But if you understand the safety basics, you'll be able to quickly react to ever-changing site conditions. First, look at personal protective equipment, or PPE. Gloves are standard to help reduce hand scrapes, burns, cuts, and other injuries. There are different types of gloves for a variety of hazards. Cotton gloves won't protect you from chemical spills, and rubber gloves won't protect you from cuts and scrapes. Let's take a few minutes to discuss blood-borne pathogens. You should know by now that coming into contact with someone else's blood and blood products exposes you to hepatitis, and the HIV or AIDS virus. You'll receive more training on this, but you should never allow yourself to be exposed to blood or blood products unless you've been trained and have proper personal protection. What this means is that you should wear latex or rubber gloves when administering first aid to someone who is bleeding that could come in contact with your exposed skin. You should not administer first aid or CPR unless you have proper protection and have been trained to perform these functions. Persons who administer emergency medical procedures have been trained. They have the proper personal protective equipment to reduce their exposure to bloodborne pathogens, and they may have received the hepatitis vaccinations to reduce the risk of the hepatitis virus. Keep in mind, your protection and safety are equally important as disaster victims, so there's no reason to take chances when your health and safety are in danger. Eye protection is a must for prevention of eye injuries. Dust, loose flying debris from machines can create eye hazards which can be reduced by the wearing of safety glasses. For face protection, particularly if you're using drills, grinders, or other cutting machinery, wear a face shield over your safety glasses. In the event of a broken drill, abrasive wheel, or other hazards, safety glasses will protect your eyes, but the face shield will protect your face. Always wear safety glasses under your face shield. Foot protection should be steel-toed safety boots. However, a minimum of leather-topped boots or shoes is required. Never wear sandals or tennis shoes because they offer no protection from cuts, scrapes, punctures from the bottom of the soles, or protection from chemical spills. There are many other items of personal protection that may be issued and required, such as hard hats. Hard hats are to be worn with the bill forward and not turned around backwards. 
wear your hard hats because falling debris can cause serious head injuries. You may be required to use fall protection when climbing at heights, but generally you'll be trained on how to use fall protection if required. Okay, what about respirators? Sure, but you just can't use any respirator because you have to know what the hazard is and select the proper equipment for that particular hazard. Asbestos hazards require special respirators. Hydrogen sulfide requires a different respirator, and so on. The scene commander or incident commander will usually be prepared to indicate what type of personal protective equipment is required, and these will be issued to you when needed. How about those dust masks? Dust masks are for dust. Some disposable masks can prevent some toxic vapors from entering your breathing zone, but keep in mind that a proper dust mask is good only for dust and does not protect you from fumes, gases, vapors, and other chemicals. Know the hazard, then select the respirator that reduces the effects of that particular hazard. In some instances, particularly in the early stages of a disaster, firefighters and other trained personnel will wear air-supplied respirators. This means that they breathe the air from the purified air cylinder strapped to their back and don't rely upon respirators to filter the harmful fumes in the work zone. Normally, before you can wear any respirator, you must be fit tested on a specific respirator to make sure it fits properly. People with beards and facial hair can't be fitted with respirators because you can't affect a seal on your face because it'll leak around the facial hair. If you're missing dentures or have unusual facial features, you may not be able to wear respirators. Just remember that specific hazards require specific type respirators designed to reduce the effects of that particular hazard. If you're required to wear respirators, you need to be fit tested and trained. In any disaster, whether man-made or natural, there are many potential hazards such as chemicals, steam, sewer gas, water, electricity, power lines, and more. The first rule of thumb is to assume the atmosphere in the disaster area is potentially explosive. Natural gas escaping mixed with air can cause an explosion from a match, lighter, static electrical spark, light switch, or other ignition sources. Chemical spills can create flammable atmospheres. Treat these areas as potentially explosive until they've been tested and declared safe to enter. Use explosion-proof flashlights where possible. Turning on and off electrical equipment or the sparks from a combustion engine or generator can ignite flammable vapors. Sparks created from falling debris or building materials can ignite flammable vapors. Think about the potential hazard and then use your good judgment and expertise in reducing the hazard as much as possible. If you understand how explosive atmospheres are created and what ignition sources can ignite these atmospheres, then you can avoid the things that could create an explosion. You're on your way to safety. When refueling vehicles or engines with flammable liquids, think about static electricity. The flammable liquid can explode if the liquid being transferred from one container to another is mixed with air and the static electricity created by the flowing liquid can cause an explosion. You reduce this potential by bonding and grounding. Let's say you're transferring gasoline from a 55-gallon container to a 5-gallon container. The 55-gallon container should have a ground wire from the metal container running through an approved copper wire to a ground rod driven deeply into the ground. This is called grounding. Next, you make metal-to-metal -metal contact from the 55-gallon drum to a wire leading to metal-to-metal -metal contact on the 5-gallon container. This is called bonding. You've bonded the 5-gallon container to the 55-gallon container, and the 55-gallon container is grounded to the ground. Therefore, potential static electricity will go through the path of least resistance, or the bonding wire, to the ground wire into the ground where it's dissipated. Bonding and grounding reduces the explosion potential when transferring flammables from one container to another. Next, there may be a variety of chemicals at a disaster site. Chemicals that may be leaking from the disaster and chemicals that may be brought to the site for cleanup or other uses. Never mix any chemicals together unless you've been trained and authorized to do so. If you see a chemical spill or suspect chemical leaks, get help. Don't try to figure it out for yourself. 
leave that to the experts. There are many chemicals that can cause immediate harm or death, so if you see a leak or spill, report it to proper authorities so it can be investigated and if hazardous, then steps can be taken to remove the hazard from the disaster scene. Material safety data sheets are generally available on disaster scenes, so proper information about a particular chemical can be provided to everyone working in the area. Don't take chances with flammable atmospheres or chemical leaks, as these can be quite serious and dangerous to everyone working at the site and to the victims. There are experts on scene that will assist you with these extremely dangerous conditions, so don't take chances. Keep in mind that some types of dust can also be an explosive potential, as well as hazardous to your health. If you're not sure, get help or ask the experts about the health hazard and combustible explosive dust formations. Digging and removing debris to get to victims is quite hazardous to the person removing the debris and to the victim. Often shoring or bracing of walls and other material is required before you remove any debris. Cranes and other construction equipment may be required as well. Crane operators are experienced professionals, but one of the hazards of crane operations is people not watching out for the crane and the material that's being lifted. Stay away from cranes and lifted loads. In a busy disaster environment, everyone will be working as fast as possible, and it'll be a very busy place. Crane operators generally cannot see you or hear you, so if you're not trained in guiding or directing a crane, stay away from those types of operations. The same applies for bulldozers and backhoes. Equipment operators are busy and are paying attention to their responsibilities, so don't get in their way or make their job more hazardous. Portable equipment use requires trained personnel. Using jackhammers, hydraulic jacks, and other equipment can be dangerous if not used properly. So if you haven't been trained and authorized to use portable equipment, don't use it. Leave that to the professionals. Watch your footing and where you walk. Collapsed floors, walls, doors, and other materials can give way and create a hazardous condition. Move about carefully and consider your footing at all times. Slips and falls are quite frequent under these conditions and broken bones and other injuries can be serious and take away from the relief efforts of everyone else. Your safety is extremely important. In the wintertime, there's always the danger of exposure to cold weather and the overexposure to extreme temperatures. Wear appropriate protective clothing and take care of your body. Hypothermia results when the body loses heat faster than it can produce it. Hands and feet are generally the first to be affected. Involuntary shivers can begin when the body continues to lose heat, and the shivers usually are the first real warning sign of hypothermia. Further loss of heat produces speech difficulty, forgetfulness, loss of manual dexterity, collapse, and finally death. Don't forget that the temperature can be 10 degrees, but with a wind chill factor, the real temperature could be 30 degrees below zero. The wind blows away the thin layer of air that acts as an insulator between the skin and the outside temperature. You have to use your good judgment, and if you feel impaired at any time, seek medical attention or notify your team leader. Problems arising from heat stress are more common than those presented in cold environments. There are a variety of problems that arise from overexposure to hot environments, and these include heat cramps, heat exhaustion, heat strain, and heat stroke. But the most important thing to remember in hot environments is to drink plenty of liquids, at least every 15 minutes, even if you're not thirsty. If you begin to feel dizzy or show signs of extreme fatigue or other symptoms, stop what you're doing and get help. Excess humidity adds to the degree of heat stress and you must use good judgment and get help if you're having symptoms of overexposure to heat. One quick word about other disaster team members. It's quite normal for you to work side by side with specialists and experts in disaster assistance, but your job is just as important as anyone else on the scene. You may be moving debris, picking up trash, doing odd jobs, but it's an important function, so don't get discouraged about your job assignment. Provide the best level of service possible on every task assigned. Don't think your job is less important or think that you're not contributing to the overall relief effort Everyone has a job, each equally important. One caution about animals. 
never feed or disturb search animals. They're specially trained and are sensitive to whatever they've been trained to find, and if you play with them, feed them, or disturb them, it could take away from the relief effort. Their trainers will care for them and do your part by leaving them completely in their trainer's hands. If you find pets in the disaster area, use caution here. They're frightened, and even though you may have the best intentions in helping them, they may react naturally and try to bite you. Certainly, they too must be rescued, but use your good judgment and common sense when handling animals. There are many conditions, potential hazards, and procedures we couldn't fit into this program, but we've scratched the surface. We've discussed personal protective equipment and the need to use the equipment as it was intended and when required. We talked about chemicals and flammable atmospheres, bonding and grounding, cold, heat, and other things, but it's really just the beginning. You need training on respirators and how to use them. You need to understand fit testing of respirators and many other things. How about simple emergency procedures, such as how to use a fire extinguisher? You need to know how to use them, what type of extinguisher works best with a particular type of fire, and how to put out a fire with an extinguisher. Training, planning, and educating yourself before a disaster strikes is quite important. When a disaster strikes, the button is pushed and you're there. Too late to learn about explosions, chemicals, firefighting, and all the other things you need to keep yourself your team and the victims safe. Dedicate yourself to all the professionals who've gone before you and performed magnificently under adverse conditions because in time of need, you're the person who performs the assistance and helps save lives. Make sure you save yourself in the process. Disaster assistance and your expertise is not a matter of if it will happen, but a matter of when it will happen. Thank you. <laughs>